This week, we have a powerhouse lineup. First, we welcome Dave DeWalt, founder and CEO at Night Dragon, to discuss how the evolving threat landscape drives innovation in cybersecurity. In our second segment, we welcome Tom Parker, founder and CEO at Hubble Technology, to discuss emerging trends CISOs should be paying attention to. Buckle up and hang on. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for business. Let's talk about something that's becoming increasingly important for enterprise companies worldwide, cyber risk management. Traditionally, cyber risk has been managed manually in silos, separate from the business's core operations. The future is about getting real-time risk insights benchmarked against your industry peers through automation. And CyberSync's CyberStrong platform is leading the charge. CyberStrong is not just another point solution. It's a revolutionary platform. It's a quantified top-down risk approach where your unique cyber risk informs C-suite decision-making to identify your top five cyber risks and the controls to mitigate them. Sign up for your free cyber risk analysis by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CyberSync. Panoptica, Cisco's cloud application security solution provides end-to-end lifecycle protection for cloud-native application environments. It empowers organizations to safeguard their APIs, serverless functions, containers, and Kubernetes environments. Panoptica ensures comprehensive cloud security, compliance, and monitoring at scale, offering deep visibility, contextual risk assessments, and actionable remediation insights for all your cloud assets. Get more information at securityweekly.com forward slash panoptica. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 342, recorded March 18th, 2024. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining remotely for this wonderful lineup today are my co-hosts. First, Mr. Jason Albuquerque. How's the water, babe? Hey, it's it's better now, man. We had a lot of rain here in southern New England, so I had to, uh, I had to fight some water with some sump pumps. We're good to go now, my friend. All right, good. Yeah, we missed you last week. Also, this is the one, joined, time, this is the one time I wish for snow instead of rain. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I ever pray for snow in New England. So, <laughs> also joining for this segment, Mr. Ben Carr. Welcome, Ben. Hey, Matt. How's it going today? We have good. To we Jason an inflatable mattress at uh, Walmart so he can uh, navigate his basement. <laughs> Yes. It's going to be an indoor pool now, Ben. Indoor pool. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Salt or chlorine? <laughs> it's definitely going to be cheaper than the one my wife's trying to put in the backyard. I'll, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> Security Weekly listeners save $100 on their RSA Conference 2024 full conference pass. RSA Conference will take place May 6th to May 9th in San Francisco and on demand. To register using our discount code, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC24 and use the code 54USECWEEKLY. We hope to see you there. Dave DeWalt is one of the prominent leaders in cybersecurity and technology. A four-time CEO, Dave has been at the helm of some of the most impactful companies in the sector, creating more than $20 billion in shareholder rev- uh, value, driving some of the largest acquisition deals and IPOs in history. He currently serves as founder and CEO of Night Dragon, a venture capital and advisory firm building the world's largest platform for growth for late stage cybersecurity, safety, security, and privacy companies. A thought leader on cybersecurity and technology issues, Dave has appeared on CNBC, The Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, Forbes, Bloomberg, and finally, Security Weekly. Dave, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Matt, thanks for having me. I love your radio voice, by the way. And Jason, this is probably a bad time to tell you I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. We don't have any rain down here. So if you could pass a little of it our way to the desert, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, I'll I'll trade you a little bit. (laughs) So thanks, Dave. I I tell everybody I have a face for radio. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm not going to make any comment from there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I got I to gotta set this up a little bit. F- almost five years ago, uh, we had the inaugural Global Cyber Innovation Summit in uh, Baltimore. It was at the Pen- Pen- Pendry uh, Hotel. I invited you personally to come on the podcast. So it only took me almost five years to get you here. But what I think is interesting about that timeline is a whole bunch of stuff stuff has changed in the last five years. I mean, that's pre-pandemic. I mean, if we think about what's transpired from 2019 to 2024, uh, I mean, we've had a lot of change, haven't we, Dave? Yeah, we sure have. And uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm sorry it's been five years. Uh, We'll we'll have to renew that contract yearly now and, uh, you know, get me on here. But Listen, it's amazing when I think back five years ago, like it almost feels like 50, right, to us all, you know, the pandemic, right, in the middle of all of that. But when you really think of it from a uh, world of threats and risks, that's where you see it most pronounced, Matt. And and team here, we, um, we've watched an era, I think of it as an era ending. And, you know, we had 80 years, two major waves of globalization occur for the planet. It was an incredible run of globalization. And it came to a bit of a screeching halt as a result of the pandemic. And we're seeing the the sort of outcroppings of that with not just the supply chain issues and the vaccination, but now, you know, we have regional wars. We've got, you know, all kinds of difficult challenges, geopolitical challenges, uh, obviously creating a lot of new threat environments, regulation environments. I mean, everything amped up a level since the last time we talked. And it's just amazing. And I moved from California to Arizona, so I got that going too. So that was a major change. <laughs> yeah, I moved from Colorado to Texas. That was a major change too. <laughs> if we think about some of the big items, right? I, so if, if I, I'm going to summarize quickly and then I'll let you kind of elaborate. We went from in an office to fully remote, created this really interesting hybrid world that creates a very different threat landscape because now you can't control the environment as easily. The perimeter is almost completely evaporated in, in many respects, right? We see the nation state attacks picking up and a lot of the things from the regional conflicts and in the geopolitical environment in this kind of hybrid remote workforce we get the introduction of artificial intelligence and all the things that start to come around, um, creating content, video, deep fakes. Like it, it feels like it's almost an impossible set of threats to solve for. Yeah, I think you summarized it well, Matt. I mean, that's that's the ominous side of what what we're seeing is you know this this intense i called it a perfect storm you might have heard me talk for many years i I called it a perfect storm all the way back to when i was ceo of mcafee and i'd always predicted this perfect storm of technology inertia and all this amazing wonderful tech but then in the wake of all this amazing tech was all these vulnerabilities because capitalism raced to release technology security by design wasn't really a thing still isn't so we got all these vulnerabilities all these vulnerabilities then created a big attack surface for the bad guys to do bad things. We then watched the danger levels increase, you know, year after year after year. When I was first CEO of McAfee, it was like, wow, there was, I love you virus. And like the virus would be spread around. It would pop up and say, I love you. Like that was really scary, but it grew right in the crime and the espionage and the terrorism and the warfare and you know, here we are with, uh, you know, trillions of damages a year in the cyberspace. And now we have all this regulation. We have all these geopolitical tensions and all these attackers can hide behind anonymity on the Internet. And you put that all together and we have this perfect storm and suddenly it's at its heights right now. And but the good news, if there is a good news, is, I mean, we're seeing waves of technology now that is got hope too and danger, right? I mean, you've seen generative AI, we can talk about that. We've now seen quantum computing meets generative AI. We've watched accelerating compute platforms like NVIDIA, you know, really create a platform for us all to build. We've watched the inertia of the cloud. We, you know, just so many things are happening that you put all this tech growing, all this regulation growing, all this threat growing, all this conflict growing. May we live in interesting times. Uh, And here we are, 2024. Dave, quick question for you. Do you think 
you think as organizations were set up for success, right? I mean, we just talked about all of these different pressures on businesses, on CISOs, on leaders. But I mean, if you look at the makeup of board of directors today, I don't think we're going in the right direction. Um, you know, we don't have cybersecurity expertise on boards. We barely have technical expertise on boards. And that's really where we should be commanding this level of resilience is from the top, right? So, I, you know, I don't think we're making the right motion and the right movement when it comes to having cyber risk leaders at a board level. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Jason, I mean, you you ask a really good question and one of the most germane of all, right? Um, you know, do we have a voice from the top in the world of cyber risk? And the answer is no, we don't. And that voice from the top has to come from the board, has to come from the management team, has to come from the composition of that voice with experts in the room. Uh, we put out a report last year, Night Dragon did. We worked with uh, the government, but we also worked with a lot of the constituents like the National Association of Corporate Directors, ISS, Glass-Lewis, the proxy solicitors, the proxy managers, the community. And what did we learn? 1.4% of the Fortune 500 has a cyber expert. I mean, that's three people, like three companies, right? And more than 54% of them didn't even have a tech expert, like not even somebody who qualified under their own skills assessments to say they had a technical expert. So if you have more than half the Fortune 500 without even a technical person on it, and only 1% or so with a cyber expert, does anybody think there's a problem here? And the answer is we do. And therefore, shareholders don't know how to look at risk. Cyber is. And that's a problem, too. So our fiduciary responsibilities to run companies is to really understand risk. And if you don't have that talent, you can't report that risk. You can't manage that risk. You're not doing your duty of care or your fiduciary responsibility. And that needs to change, in my opinion. And the SEC had an opportunity to do some of this, right, mm -hmm. Dave? I mean, the one piece in the original guidelines that they were working on was to have that cyber expertise at the board level. They punted on that. Now, they they definitely for are going to force clients, you know, public companies now to report on their cyber risk and materiality and, and disclose those. But they had an opportunity to actually solve part of this gap and they punted. But, well, but take that I even could. further, Matt. Like that that's so that's regulatory, right? Like we see the regulatory stuff jump in when people aren't willing to respond. But I, I just want to jump in and ask Dave, like you know, you, you think there, there's two things. One, one is you first have to identify that there's a problem. But like, I think we've done that, right? Like most companies identify cyber in the top three, if not the top risk to the organization generally, right? At least that, that's what I've seen. And I'd be interested to say if you agree with that. If you do agree with that, like then the question is, why aren't they doing anything about it? Like it, it would seem that there'd be a core incentive there. Um, I think some of the discussions around materiality right now and like, what shareholders should actually be concerned with, the average shareholder. I don't think they know, but I certainly think the board knows there an issue, knows there's an issue there. Why, just why aren't they responding to it? I think it's a lack of expertise and knowledge. I mean, it goes back to what we were just talking about. And, you know, I sit on public boards and a lot of them, and um, I speak to them all the time. The, uh, the survey we did, just to give you a little more shocking statistic, is the average board spends 42 minutes a year on cyber. Let me repeat that, 42 minutes a year. Does anybody think they're spending the right amount of time if you spend 42 minutes a year on average on cybersecurity? So you're spending, you know, what happens is the CISOs get marched into the boardroom, they give a six minute report out, say, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, this, that, and then they leave again. And that's the end of the conversation, it's a checkbox. And so we've got to systemically build this into our governance framework, and that's what's been missing. And the SEC, Matt, had a chance to do it. You know, I think of it like a Sarbanes, a Sarbanes Oxley moment. Like we had, mm -hmm. you know, I have 302, 404 written on my arm practically after all the years of running public companies because we all know Sarbanes Oxley and changes in revenue accounting as a result of that and criminal offenses related to noncompliance of it. And the SEC had a chance, but directionally we moved the ball right so i'm thankful you know this government administration has moved the ball more than any that i've seen um not just with public private partnerships but with regulation as well and we did take a step in the right direction yeah there's questions about materiality and when to create an incident reporting how to do that reporting but it's a start right so when you can report you can create awareness 
And eventually what we need is governance at the board level with expertise, the right amount of time. Then we got to manage that risk through enterprise risk management. Then we got to correct those risks if we have a problem. Then we got to report those risks, risk factors in our proxies and our 10Ks. Then we have to manage that cycle over and over until it's better and better. And that's what happened in Sarbanes-Oxley. That's what should happen here. And in my opinion, it will. It's just going to take a little time. And I hope we continue that progress, honestly, because we need it. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, there are competing priorities. There's competing priorities in the business. There's competing priorities at the board. And unless you have that evangelist and that person waving the flag, bringing it to the forefront, making it a priority to the board, it's going to get overrun with other priorities. Right? We need that evangelist on the board. It has to happen. It has to happen. And uh, by the way, this isn't a lack of talent, right? We have, we have plenty of CISOs and plenty of amazing people who understand business risk, cyber risk, and can be a participant and a contributor on these boards. We just haven't prioritized it. We have now diversity and equity inclusion, which is a good start too. We need that as well. But why can't we find, let's see, diversity, inclusion with cyber expertise when we're recruiting? The answer is we can do that too, because there's a lot of strong women and people of color who have this capability, we can solve a lot of things at one time. We just got to get it in the brains that part of the search criteria needs to be cyber expertise and it'll happen. So Dave, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question. I think I know the answer to this. I think one of the challenges, so I, I, had this crazy idea right around Sarbanes-Oxley to create my first startup in the GRC space, what was known as a GRC space. And if I think about what's missing from an innovation perspective is even to this day, it's very hard to communicate risks to the board in the language of the business. And I think this is where cyber risk quantification capabilities and some of the innovation in that space can bridge the gap that the traditional legacy GRCs have not done a good job of, myself included in the early days. Um, I'm curious, is that one of the areas you see some innovation going to happen to help kind of close that gap because we need to do it if we're going to get the board engaged? Yeah, Matt, I mean, I think you're hitting on one of the hottest categories. And I think an important category going forward is just cyber risk quantification and implementing metrics that enable us to um, create visibility to that risk, measure and manage that risk, um, and then ultimately remediate that risk. It's, it's a thing that has to happen. But if you're a board member, you're like, well, what is my risk? And if you don't have good risk quantification and metrics, you don't know how to measure and monitor that risk and remediate that risk. So finally, now there's tools that I'm seeing coming onto the market that can you know, not only create visibility to your attack surface and all your assets, can actually monitor vulnerabilities and threats against that attack surface, and then can help you understand risk as it relates to vulnerabilities and threats that are occurring. Therefore, you can measure and monitor it. So for the first time, this is kind of evolving. It's exciting to see. And then eventually we can incorporate risk quantification and risk factors into everything we're reporting. And it makes it like a business risk, which is exactly what other risk areas of a business can quantify better and I think our time is here now for that. And so I'm hoping in the next two or three years, this becomes mainstream for every company, not just public companies to use as a tool. Dave, I hope, I hope some of those, um, those new tool sets or platforms help find the blind spots too, right? Ultimately, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. It's the say easy, do hard. Most organizations don't even know what assets they have. They don't even have their assets defined classified, right? And I mean, those things are getting more and more important, especially in the age of AI. Data is an asset. Data needs to be classified. Data needs to be protected, right? So, you know, most organizations don't even have visibility into some of the assets that they have. Jason, That's you're right on. You're right on. I mean, if you look back at my 20 plus years in the cyberspace and you look at every major threat wave, where did the threat wave start? Lack of visibility to an asset, right? And so it, if you don't have visibility to your assets, you can't solve it. So think about where we're at now with some of our expanding attack surface. And this is what keeps me up at night, you know, in the cyberspace is there's so many tangential markets evolving around cyber. I call it future fusion, or I did. Now I just call it current fusion because the cyber market in your digital domain is fusing with a bunch of other domains around it 
creating a tougher and tougher job for CISOs because now it's not just protect my own digital network. It's like, wow, I got to protect my whole supply chain because guess what? Attackers are now attacking me through my supply chain. Oh, wait, there's a thing called blockchain. Oh, wait, there's all these physical ramifications of cyber. Oh, there's an industrial network over there. I better go look at that too. And suddenly this market is emerging bigger and bigger, tax surface bigger and bigger, if everything gets digitized, and it all starts with understanding your asset and visibility to it. So, <laughs> I mean, Jason went down this path. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double click on it a little more. In the early days, it was all about best and breed point solutions. Jason talked about a platform. As we think about these things like understanding your assets and your threats and your vulnerabilities and risk quantification, is the best of breed going to get replaced by platform plays that can bring all this stuff together, even though it may not be perfect? Because we're, I'm seeing a lot of pressure from a budget perspective to consolidate vendors. You're starting to see some more platform plays. Like, what does this market hold for platform players versus kind of the standalone best of breed players do we see a shift coming well you just hit on you know almost if you had to write uh like a narrative for the cyber markets like it's a i call it like this pendulum between best of breed and best of suite right so you have this this inertia that goes back and forth and a lot of it has to do with what's the threat environment that's going on and potentially the budget environment and the the economic environment around it so like when i was ceo of mcafee you know my entire playbook at mcafee was the best of suite right i tried to bundle every endpoint feature into my single console single agent kind of strategy to platformization the endpoint and it worked i built the company into a multi-billion dollar revenue company and we were able to take advantage of best of suite and then all of a sudden the threats really rise and something's happening over in industrial or iot or the cloud and best of breed emerge. And if you almost look at what Wiz is doing now, they're creating a platform for cloud security. And they consolidated a lot of little, you know, sort of best of breed vendors into a suite. And now it became best of breed in a suite. And when you get best of breed in a suite, you get a lot of takeoff. And that's what Wiz was able to see up to hundreds of millions in a three, four year period, pretty impressive. CrowdStrike did this as well. Palo Alto Networks did it as well. And you're watching that. But I'm a believer that this market moves too fast for a platform. It just does. And there's just too much new things. Wow, AI came out. Wow, quantum came out. Wait, there's a new risk called electronic warfare. A new way to attack and hack computers isn't even malware anymore. It's radio frequency interference to the device itself or to exfiltrate data through radio frequencies. Well, what's CrowdStrike going to do about that? So you start to look at the new threat, and it evolves best of breed. And that's the wonderful thing about our market in a way from an innovation point of view. But also the hardest part to solve if you're a CISO is these threats move fast, the attack surface moves fast, and it's going to be a balance of sweet and best of breed, in my opinion, going forward. It's just It just is. It, you bring up some really interesting use cases, which it, which I agree with, right? I mean, I think what CrowdStrike and Palo and, and some of the larger platform players have done is taken some really good technologies, embedded them into a platform. And you also identify some areas of gaps in those platforms. What are some of those other gaps? Like if we think about, based on the threat landscape today, where are some of those other innovation areas that are going to drive like some of these best of breed solutions to start to emerge? Yeah, there's a couple areas, Matt, worth discussing. Like one of them, you know, I hate to say I was a pioneer in it, but I, I was with FireEye, I created a crowd, right? So just hear me for a second. I tried to create the power of the crowd into a platform. And in FireEye's case, um, indicators of compromise could be shared amongst the crowd and it created a platform and created a moat for me at FireEye. Let me grow the company to a billion in revenue. CrowdStrike came along and called themselves CrowdStrike, did the same thing, created a moat for themselves. But guess what AI is doing? Guess what generative AI is doing? The power of the crowd's a lot lower bar to hit because now I can build a large language model. I can create open source in to collect hundreds of thousands of feeds into my large language model. And I can create a power of the crowd with technology now that can usurp some of the incumbents that were in there before. So generative AI with large language models with these transformers the way they are can really change the crowd power, which means now victim one 
can alert all the other potential victims and you can create speed of response in a way that before generative AI, I didn't see as much of that and access to that. And then the other one is automation, Matt. It's amazing what AI can bring us from an automation point of view. Not only are we going to create you know, security automation uh, for services, we're going to create uh, security automation for managed services. Uh, what was really limited by humans in a SOC can be automated now. The tech I'm watching there is amazing. So from a good point of view, what once was, you know, only the 1% of the 1% could afford the best talent in their SOC and the poor, small and medium business getting hit by a ransomware couldn't even afford one person. Security automation brought on by AI can help level that a little bit more. And that's really encouraging too. So watching those two, along with now some of the newer threats, like one of my biggest worries in the world, and it was the number one threat coming out of Davos was what's called cognitive warfare. So cognitive warfare is this misinformation, disinformation warfare game that people are playing. We see it in the United States. We see it all over the world. How do we stop these misinformation, disinformation campaigns when we can't even determine what's a real or a deep fake or a what? And now we're watching narrative intelligence products come up and quickly that are essentially able to use large language models to sample social media platforms, create a narrative, detect a fake, and create content integrity analysis on that. And boy, do we need these products quickly. So if some of these new categories emerge and can do it at scale, every company in the world will need to buy it. It'll be a new market. So those are some cool things coming that I, I get excited about technology-wise. Does that then put some threats into some of the players? So two of the first markets you mentioned, the threat intel players. Does this disrupt the traditional threat intelligence market that we've been used to knowing, which is bring in a bunch of IOCs into a common platform and use those? Does Gen AI disrupt that core, that core market? Same thing when it comes to, um, uh, what was the other use case? Sorry, I just, just lost it. Oh, oh, automation or yeah automation the whole soar platforms right like does this disrupt what we used to know as as the soars right like are those two markets you know ripe for disruption do they have to evolve quickly or do new players come in and fill the gap well and there lies the best of breed versus best of suite right and yeah. if you're going to win in best of breed you you got to know your window and i always teach ceos this if you don't know your window on what your market TAM is and how long your TAM is open for and know how to execute in that window, you will get crushed. And so the best of suite, which are slower reactors on the innovation dilemma game, they will buy it. And so you got to innovate before they can buy and bundle. And if you can do that effectively, you can create a new market. Wiz did that. He, Wiz caught them without being able to respond. And now Wiz is a 10 billion value company and worth hundreds of millions. And you can see that happen in various sectors, but boy, is it a timing game to have that happen. So narrative intelligence, CRQ, you know, automation of the SOC, these are all ones up for grab and who's going to get it. So Dave, you've been, you know, we've been talking about kind of the response and the, you know, the cyber side of, you know, how we respond to these threats and issues. But especially when you think about timing, does that does that window start to shrink? Does it start to get smaller? The time to innovate gets smaller. The time to react gets smaller because of all the stuff on automation and AI that's also taking advantage, being taken advantage by the threat actors, right? So it, we used to have a lot of time to kind of respond, figure out how we were going to generate um, a resolution to a problem. But I, it, it seems like what you're talking about and what I've seen in the market, like that's definitely kind of altering the calculus on on our ability to respond to those threats. Yeah, Ben, I mean, I think you hit it, right? I mean, the window gets shorter. There's more players in this game. There's over 3,500 cyber companies identifying themselves as cyber now. Uh, we had over 50 billion of capital. 50 billion of capital go in last year alone. That was up from 45 billion the year before. So you start putting 50 billion of capital to work in the 3,500 plus cyber companies, people innovate pretty quickly. And so, you know, this is an interesting market that's very complex and very global now. And, you know, the best of suite has to keep up, but the best of breed has to execute. I think it's fascinating. It's fun to watch as a venture capitalist now picking and choosing which ones. And I find it way easier to tell CEOs what to do than do it myself. So this is a great job. 
<laughs> so, so Dave, I mean, at, at this point in time, in, in you know, 2024, is this a good time to start a company? I mean, think about it. In, in 21, 22, we were at a high, right? I mean, at the end of the day, there was a ton of investment going on. Is it, is it a day and age where you're waiting to be acquired versus getting investment? I mean, what, is this a good, the main question, is this a good time to start a company? A hundred percent think it's a good time to start a company. Yeah. I really do. I mean, we are still like in the middle of this perfect storm. Maybe you're having that in Rhode Island. Uh, you know, this is a <laughs> this is a storm that's not changing. I mean, do you do you think we're going to have peace in the world of cyber anytime soon? Absolutely. I, you know, I hate to say it, it ain't <laughs> yeah. happening. Right? China, U.S. getting worse. U.S., yeah. Russia, North Korea. You know, I mean, we now have three thousand plus attackers. I mean, last year alone, we got 953 net new attackers identified. Can you imagine environment? When I was CEO of FireEye and Mandan, we tracked almost every attacker by their TDPs. We had about 800, 880. We grew by 953 last year alone. So in the history of cyber, we had 880. Now we grew by that much in one year. So there's nothing changing this threat environment and therefore building companies to solve a threat I always tell CEOs in the cyber, if you can find evil, you can find a market, right? And if you find yep. evil, or you can even emulate evil, you're going to have, you know, a market to grow in. So I think it's still a good time, especially with AI. It allows you to leapfrog now. And with quantum-based computing platforms now, boy, do we have environments to build companies quicker. And I never thought I'd see a day within three years from start to, to uh, now so I'm going to get 300 million of ARR like Wiz did. And there's quite a few right on the heels of that, which are very impressive. Last year, last thing I'll say is um, I'm going to do the same thing at uh, RSA this year where I do the 100-100 club. So these are companies that hit 100 million of ARR growing at 100%. Last year, I did 12 of them in a row, 12-minute mm -hmm. interviews, 12 in a row. But they're all there. And it's pretty cool to watch the, the up-and-coming ones that are really uh, taking this market by storm. Outstanding. I love it. It's a fascinating market. Uh, I love it. We, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. It's, it's really great to get your insight. Dave, thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Yeah, Matt, Ben, Jason, good to see you guys. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, Our pleasure. You. Can't wait to have you back. With that, we're going to take a quick break and then welcome Tom Parker from Hubble Technology.